Okay, so I will maybe slowly start with the introduction. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this last seminar for this uh, spring semester uh, by the Eurostract Association. I will just briefly mention that the Eurostract is an association that emerged uh, as a result of a cost action, a European cost action on quality specifications for uh, roadway bridges standardization at the European level, as was the title at the time. Uh, and the outcome uh, of uh, you know, the network that was formed as part of, of this four-year cost action uh, was this association that deals with uh, improving quality of bridges and structures in a European network and uh, also at, uh, at large. As part of the promotion of cooperation and understanding of current practices and latest research developments, we have established this series of live talks, uh, which is actually also co-sponsored by the University of Vigno the Federal Association for Concrete FIB, uh, and also Boutique, who are uh, assisting our dissemination and media activities. Um, and these live talks bring, to, bring together experts from different domains of structural engineering who share their perspectives on issues uh, of uh, timeliness for the, for the community. Uh, we also make sure that you can then find these talks uh, as part of uh, the postings that you will see on our webpage. And so before, uh, we go into the introduction of today's speaker. I would like to thank uh, uh, Joan Casas from the University uh, of uh, Catalonia, who is the co-moderator for today. He will introduce our next speaker in a few minutes. And I would also like to get some of the administrative details out of the way, uh, just to mention that the live talk will be recorded and made available in our YouTube channel and then also on the webpage, as I also mentioned. Uh, we would like to ask the participants to keep their cameras turned off and the microphones muted to facilitate the recording and the session. And uh, importantly, also for the Q&A, uh, the question should be sent to the Eurostract Asso Association participant, who is our main uh, support through Sergio Fernandez, um, through the chat function. And the, these questions will be forwarded to us. We will bring them over to the speaker as soon as the talk is completed. And with this, I would like to give the floor to John, who will be introducing uh, our speaker for today. Thank you, uh, Eleni. Hello, everybody. So uh, it's my big pleasure to introduce you our speaker for today. She is Tracy Baker, Associate Professor and Ed and Diane Wilson Presidential Chair in Structural Engineering at the University of California in Berkeley. She has expertise in the design modeling and experimental testing of high performance structural systems used for limiting structural and component losses in seismic events. Her research has focused on expanding the use of seismic isolation to a broader category of structures, understanding ultimate failure mechanisms of isolated buildings to ensure robust designs and improving existing control systems to further minimize a structural response in seismic events. As part of this work, she conducted the first bidirectional test of triple friction pendulum bearings, and also the first dynamic failure test of double concave bearings, as well as multiple other experimental programs. The data from her work has been used to develop new models and propose new design guidance for these systems. She received, she received his Bachelor in Structural Engineering from University of California in San Diego, followed by her master's and PhD in structural engineering, mechanics and materials from University of California at Berkeley. Afterwards, she spent almost two years as a Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science postdoctoral researcher at the Disaster Prevention Research Institute at Kyoto University. Professor uh, Tracy Baker will uh, uh, talk today about the performance and application of seismic isolation in structures and taking into account his important curriculum, for sure, this uh, lecture will be of high interest for everybody. So please, Tracy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Joan and Lenny. I really appreciate the invitation to speak. Um, so, of course, we know that we can design buildings to be very robust after earthquakes. Um, so, for example, I'd like to start out by looking at, this is after the Tohoku earthquake in 2011. This is downtown Sendai, um, the closest metropolitan area to the epicenter of the earthquake. And clearly, we, I mean, we have tools to design buildings to withstand these earthquakes. Um, this looks like excellent performance under this event. 
Um, but sometimes when we zoom in and we look at details, we see different pictures. So this is inside one of those buildings at in um, Tohoku. And you can see that the non-structural damage was immense um, from this earthquake. So clearly, even though the building is standing, we have significant downtime, perhaps loss of life if people are near these non-structural components. Um, and significant losses, regardless of how strong and stiff we design our structures. So, you know, protective systems we think of as changing the dynamics of our structural systems so that we can really achieve both protection of our structure as well as protection of our non structural components. And we have different uses for all of these, but it's really um, using these systems can really change how our system performs under earthquakes. And that's why it's so exciting. So I like to think about what we want from isolation. And so this is this old Vision 2000 framework where we look at on um, the vertical axis, different um, rates of exceedances of earthquakes. So going from a frequent earthquake to very rare of earthquake. And then we think about targeted system performance, operational collapse prevention. And maybe that blue line is what our goal is for a typical building. Um, we want collapse prevention under a very rare earthquake or operational under frequency. But I like to try to think about what I want from isolation when I'm doing a design. So clearly I want operational behavior under a frequent earthquake, but I probably still want operational behavior under an occasional earthquake. Maybe I want immediate occupancy under a rare event. And under a very rare event, I probably still want some combination of media occupancy, life safety. This will change whether you're doing, you know, a retrofit of a historical church versus a hospital, right? But you're investing in isolation and you should get that return on investment. So I like to try to think about what performance I really want when I'm designing this. So the nice thing about isolation is there are a lot of adaptive systems. So on the top left is a triple friction pendulum bearing. And these often, they start out with a high stiffness, they flatten out as they go larger, and then they start engaging again as you have um, large, large displacements before you have moat impact. Then on the top uh, right, you have lead rubber bearings. Um, this gets a much more round, not the hardening behavior typically. Um, and then on the bottom, you see a natural rubber bearing. And this is sort of the original triple friction, right? So you start off sort of stiff, you flatten out, and then you gradually harden as you reach large displacements. So all of these can sort of be designed with these um, goals in mind that we discussed previously. So for example, a triple friction pendulum bearing versus a fr single friction pendulum bearing, um, where I have one sliding surface on the single, four on the triple, two that are identical, um, have sort of the same behavior under what might be your design earthquake, but under that more frequent service level earthquake, whereas the single is gonna have a much higher force before breakaway, the triple is gonna have a more gradual transition. So what does that mean? Or what does that look like? So here's a triple friction pendulum bearing just on the stage one. So the black that you see around the inside is actually just a rubber gasket that sort of helps keep it clean during the earthquake or during um, typical maintenance. Um, and so you can see that was just moving on the inner surfaces. Moving on surfaces in the stage one to three, this is what it looks like. So I'm sliding both on the inner surfaces as well as those outer surfaces. And, you know, these cubes keep changing and growing and getting bigger. And there's even quintuple friction pendulum bearings that are being manufactured. And you can see this out at um, where they're being manufactured here in California. Um, and those are sometimes being used. So for example, they're using um, I, I, either a triple or a quintuple 
at the um, LACMA Museum retrofit down in LA right now. Sorry. I don't know what that is. So, um, what you can see is if we do a case study using either single or triple friction pendulum bearings, um, we've designed these two bearings on the bottom right to have the exact same um, effective uh, energy dissipation and period. And we're putting it under a, some case study three-story building with a period of 0.6 seconds. And I'm running two suites of ground motions, one that has a 50% probability of exceedance in 50 years, one that has 10% probability of exceedance in 50 years. If I do that, what I can see is as my results on the top right, left, I'm showing you the displacements and going from a fixed base building to either using an isolated building with single or triple friction pendulums, it's going to markedly decrease the displacements within the building. So they're all the drifts. So you can see, whereas my average was around one and a half drift, percent drift for a 10% 50 year event. Now I'm less than, you know, 0.25 on average. And this is a big, big benefit because, you know, partition walls start having damage around 0.5% drift. Um, so I'm making a huge improvement in terms of the operation um, and, and losses in your building. Then on the bottom right, I'm looking at the accelerations and you can see on the very right, I have a 10% in 50 years. And bringing down that response spectra from the fixed quite a bit, I have these two blue lines vertically there. And what they're highlighting is the region of um, most content in the building. So that's the region where we really care about bringing down that response spectrum. And what we see here is not only a benefit from bringing from fixed to isolated, but also you can see the benefit from kicking it from single friction pendulum to a triple friction pendulum and allowing that more gradual in reduction in strength um, with the isolator. And you can see that not only with the 10% in 50 years, but also in the 50% in 50 years event, a big reduced reduction from going to single friction pendulum to a triple friction pendulum, having a more adaptive smooth behavior. Um, is going to help you design for different levels of events over the lifetime. So that's a big thing with these um, isolation systems. They really allow you to target what performance you want under different events. Um, so I also, I'd like to get rid of this mark, but I don't know how to do it. Um, oh, well, uh, we're all going to It, it, it might uh, work if you want to briefly um... Exit. Minimize the present exit. Yes, it might be that it did it. Just to see. Yeah, I don't know where that is. <laughs> oh, but don't don't worry. About yeah, it. I think we're just gonna have to live with it, everybody. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, I also want to talk about. Um, you know, non-typical applications of isolation systems. So when we think about isolation, we think about base isolation. Um, we put it at the bottom of buildings, but it doesn't have to be. So there's a lot of applications of mid-story isolation where you're moving from one structural system to another, and that isolation provides um, a transition, and that not only um, reduces the accelerations above the isolation system, but reduces the forces of that added system to the bottom substructure. So there's that big benefit there. But you could also think about putting isolators at the tops of columns in buildings. And this eliminates the need for extensive foundation work if you're doing a retrofit, excavation for your seismic moat, and adding that additional diaphragm layer. Um, and those can all be very costly if you're doing a retrofit of isolation. But we have to think about the rotations that might be incurred on those bearings because our isolation models don't take that into account. They try to they think about having parallel top and bottom plates in isolation models. Um, uh, but the uh, if you have a flexible column below your isolator, you might have rotations. Um, 
And this can also reduce your bearing displacement capacities just a little bit. Um, I'd like to also note that, of course, this is applicable to bridges as well. If you put an isolator on top of a bridge column, um, you're thinking about what is the flexibility of your pier. So we have models that can deal with this for triple friction pendulum bearings. And you can see here, as I go from the blue to the red dotted line, um, I'm becoming a more flexible column below my isolators. And what basically starts happening is you have a gradually more flexible system. We've looked at this also for um, rubber bearings. So this is a test setup that we did when I was at McMaster University in Canada, where we looked at a bearing on top of a column and we applied rotation at the top of the bearing as well. And then as we moved the column, we'd have a little bit of rotation at the bottom of the bearing from the flexibility of the column. So we looked at using different column sizes so that we looked at different stiffness ratios between the bearings and the columns below. And we have this stiffness ratio measurement, um, looking at bearing stiffness to column stiffness. And so here you can see this is actually upside down of what the test I just showed you. These were their previous tests. What this starts looking like with a very, very tiny column that was just used experimentally. This would not be representative anything you would see in practice. But you can see as I go out to very much larger displacements, um, you start seeing rotation very clearly of that top plate that's above the bearing. And here you can see very clearly that plate above the bearing is rotating back and forth. And why we looked at this very, very skinny column is we wanted to look at extreme cases. And so here again is a zoomed in video of that same test we just looked at. And so we start seeing with the flexible column, that rotation of the top plate. So we no longer have the parallel boundary conditions on the bearing. So here are our results from this. We had at um, two different pressures on these bearings, five MPA and 2.5 MPA. And this is the percent of the um, horizontal stiffness, given that 100% would be parallel top and bottom plates. So if you reduce by 50%, you'd have a 50% reduction from our typical understanding. And so what's interesting is it didn't really matter if the rotation was coming from the top and bottom of the bearing versus just the bottom of the bearing. Um, as long as you had that same global rotation, then you had the same sort of reduction in stiffness. And you can see a very clear reduction in stiffness with rotation on the bearing. Um, and it also changes quite a bit with the pressure that's applied on your bearing. But I want to say that this, you know, looks significant, but it's actually pretty good news. So given typical designs that you'd see for, um, you know, bridges, uh, or most buildings, it's not hard to have um, a, a small enough uh, stiffness ratio that your total rotations probably don't exceed maybe 0 0.02 radians. So you're probably not going to see a reduction in stiffness more than nine or more than five or 10%. Um, so this I think is good news because what it really shows us is it's quite possible to do a design where we put the isolators on the top and not have to worry significantly about um, changes in rotation. So this can really reduce the cost of an isolation system for retrofit and open up a whole larger categories for buildings. I mean, could we just be doing condos and um, office buildings and retrofitting these with isolators at the tops of the columns, not having to do significant, significant foundation work and um, uh, have to add that extra uh, diaphragm layer. Um, so we're also doing ongoing work in this area. So here is a picture of the Coronado Bridge in San Diego. So I have students right now who are going to have um, an experimental test set up at Berkeley where we're doing a hybrid simulation of this, um, where we 
numerically are modeling um, the bridge and we're physically testing the isolators that are on top of the piers to have that rotation. And we're doing um, model updating so that what we learn instantaneously from the experiment gets applied to the numerical model as we go forward. Um, so this, I think, will bear out the same results from our component level test, but we wanted to sort of expand it to the system level so we really understand how that rotation can affect the whole system instead of just um, the individual component. So I wanna go back to this matrix that we looked at before. What do we want from isolation? Um, I talked about how adaptive systems can really help um, not only under the design level, but also under the service level. But I also wanna think about what's gonna happen in extreme earthquakes. So what I talked about here is I'd like to have immediate occupancy. I'd like to have you know, better than life safety for my isolated building under very rare events. Um, and the question really is, are we getting that? Are we thinking about that enough? So that's been a big push of mine over the past, I don't know, five years. Um, so we have to think about our ultimate design strategy. So we know isolation works really well under typical earthquake hazards, but what about in extreme events? How should we be designing? Um, so what kind of safety factors in their design? And where is the weak link? Should the weak link be the isolators, the moat, the superstructure? Um, so we first re uh, relied on using FEMA P695 methodology, where you do an incremental dynamic analysis um, and find the probability of collapse under your event. Um, and so we started to think about what is the capacity design for isolated buildings. We know capacity design for, you know, all these fixed space buildings, um, you know, moment frames have strong columns, weak beams, and brace frames have our brace buckling. What are we doing for isolated buildings? So we wanted to look at the effect of bearing displacements, the lateral force resisting system, and superstructure strength. Um, we were doing this whole study with double friction pendulum bearings. Um, it was the reason for this is because um, they are uh, we were working with collaborating with a Japanese company and these bearings are um, available in Japan widely. Um, and so it was um, particular to them. But I think, it's very similar to a single friction pendulum bearing, so it really has wide ranging application. So we started by trying to understand how these bearings actually perform under extreme events. What can we model them? Can we understand how, how they actually fail? Um, so we did these unidirectional shake table tests. Here I have two bearings. And then I have the um, mass on top of them and a frame out of plane to keep it um, in line. And what you can see is we cut the edges of the bearings so we'd be able to see these bearings um, as they moved. And we had two high-speed cameras pointing at them so that we could track them during the full motion of the test. So we looked at four different bearing designs, and I, this is quite applicable in Europe because I think that the standard is to have bearings with no rims in Europe, whereas the standard in the US is to have bearings with integrated rims um, along them. So we had four different rim designs, one that had no rims. So what you can see is this is the end of the concave surface, and then it becomes flat, and then you would fall down after there. We had these sort of specific ones to Japan where um, an external rim was bolted on uh, to the flat portion. And then we had two rims that were integrated directly into the system of two different thicknesses. We ran with um, Kobej uh, Takatori because it has this big pulse motion, which is often a concern for isolation systems near fault. Um, you get that sort of long period from the, the earthquake with matched with the long period from the bearings. So this is a movie from the bearings with no rims run at 100% 50% of JR Takatori. 
And what you can see here is these will almost fall off. So, so you can see on the left hand side, they were about here. Let's play that one more time. You can see that these bearings almost fall off. And this is the high speed camera of this same video. And you can see we're going to come back and forth a couple times. And they come up off onto the flat room. And just by luck, they're pulled back um, in the next cycle of the earthquake. So then this is 155% of that motion. You can see very similar behavior. Now we're gonna go up off on the left and actually that puck sat right down on the bolt. So, and then it again, almost falls down again here, but um, it is uh, miraculously sitting on that bolt. Now, of course, we don't know that the bolt's gonna be there and this would clearly be defined as a failure of the system. You can see multiple times it almost falls down again, but does not. Um, interestingly, you can see really clearly in this movie that as um, the flat rim slides over the puck, it scrapes off all of the friction lining on the puck. So there's a lot of damage to the puck after that motion. Um, this is by comparison, the bearing that had rims for impact. And so, of course, it's going to have very different behavior under extreme motion. Oh, that doesn't seem to be running. Let's see if we can get that going. I'm sorry. Uh, let's skip to see if this one is working. Yeah. So. Here is that same motion with the rims. What you can see is when we have impact, you get that uplift, right? So it's basically a couple that's placed on the puck and that couple causes that puck to rotate, twist, and you get a lot of bouncing after the motion. So a lot of vertical accelerations after the motion. Um, but so you're going to be placing both horizontal and vertical forces into your superstructure, but the isolator, unlike with the flat rim, has not failed. It's still there and intact. So the question is really, how do you want your building to perform? Do you care if your isolators fail? Do you care if your superstructure has large accelerations? It's that trade-off. So just to drive that point home, if you had no rim, you had a very nice typical hysteretic behavior until failure. If you had a thick rim, you had nice typical behavior until you had impact. But until that impact is driving very, very large accelerations into your superstructure. And you can see all this major fluctuation in the forces that's from the, the vertical accelerations in the isolator afterwards. So the question is, you know, which of these is really better? Um, I also want to look at the damage to the bearings really quickly. You can see with no rim, the um, flat portion of the bearing shears off the um, liners of these systems. Um, so it would, basically the liners, the, the pucks have to be uh, replaced. The bolted rim actually had the largest damage because uh, the pucks got sort of caught on the ridge in here and it gouged into the puck and then that in turn scratched the surface of the sliders. So I would say that for the no rims, the only portion you would need to replace is the puck, but for the bolted rim, the whole bearing might need to be replaced. For the thin and thick integrated rims, um, you have this, it looks like it's scratched, but it's not. That's sort of polishing that happened from the puck. So no damage to the sliding surface. Um, but you can see that the edges of the pucks are sort of bitten up and a little bit of deformation in the rims. Um, I would say that those are actually probably still usable after the earthquakes. Um, and of course, just to drive home the difference in performance, um, this is the horizontal acceleration with the increased um, ground motion. 
And you can see if you have thick rims or any rims at all, as soon as you start impacting, you have this major increase in acceleration. Whereas if you have no rims, you have no increase in acceleration until you have failure. So perhaps it's just have no rims, but make sure that you have very large displacements. Um, aftershock performance, if you had the bolted rim bearing, we re-ran at 70% of the motion before and after. Um, and there is a 10% increase in friction, whereas with the rim bearings, there's about a 5% increase in friction. So if you wanted to just continue to use the same bearings without replacement, they would still function fine. Um, so to do numerical simulations of the failure, we needed to have models of these bearings. So we started out with these abacus models of the bearings where we have impact, oops, sorry. We have impact and that impact under lighter loads actually causes that uplift and failure. And we've seen these actually in other experimental tests as well. Now, those are really lovely models, but they take far too long to run. So we have these rigid body models um, that are much more efficient. Um, and these are run just in MATLAB, and then we can integrate them with our uh, um, numerical model for our superstructure. And so you can see that the behavior predicted from the rigid body models are very similar to our abacus model performance. Um, we did the same for the flat rim models, bearings. So we have these models that can come up over the rim and have that failure mechanism there. And you can see we were pretty happy with the flat rim models. This is comparing um, the experimental, you know, time shot by time shot with the numerical on the left. And you can see that we get that same behavior where we have it going sort of horizontal on both top and bottom flat rims. And then you no longer have this sort of symmetrical behavior because your friction is different on top and bottom. And so you can see it's no longer symmetrical. We get this offset. It's just, you know, the numerical prediction is upside down from the experimental prediction. So very similar behavior. So one big takeaway when we started trying to model our experimental results is if you model one bearing versus two bearings, you're going to get very, very different behavior. So we did model the, of the bearings with rims. Um, and if you use a single bearing and the rotational restricted mass, you predict a failure with 134% of the ground motion. But we know that the bearing or that the system could go beyond that. So if you modeled two bearings, it predicted a failure at 155% motion. And we know that in our experimental studies, we still didn't get failure of the bearings at 155% motion. We didn't test beyond that because of limits of the table. Um, but we know that, uh, so this, this is still conservative. So it's really important that you have this interaction between multiple bearings. Um, and if you just are assuming the behavior of one bearing is capturing the, the system level behavior, you're gonna be very, very conservative in what you think is the failure probability of your system. So larger number of bearings is providing a larger factor of safety, this redundancy. Um, so again, to this capacity design for isolated buildings, we looked at um, baseline designs that were very similar to what you needed to do for the code. We looked at what, for in the US, stronger superstructure, using larger bearings, and also having um, no rims. So in the US, we would always have bearing rims, but perhaps we don't. And so we did this incremental dynamic analysis with FEMA P695. And this is one ground motion. What did it look like? So for moment frames, our baseline is on the very left. Um, you can see 
IMR is where we call an impact margin ratio, where we first start impacting our ground motion. And then as we move to the right, we're increasing the ground motion. We're looking at the drift ratio vertically. Um, so if you, as you can see, our drift ratios start increasing dramatically as our, um, our impact occurs. And then we had CMR collapse margin ratio at 140%. That was probably because of the failure of the bearings. Um, then you can see system two, I have a stronger superstructure um, and that pushes um, impact to happen uh, sooner because stronger superstructure correlated to stiffer superstructure, so more displacements in the bearings. And then it pushed out the collapse margin ratio a little bit for moment frames. If I have a small, larger displacement capacity, that's system three um, here, then you can see, of course, your impact doesn't happen for much larger. And then you had collapse right afterwards. So if you want to maintain that gradual increase in drift ratio, the best thing you can do is have bigger bearings. Um, and then system four is when I had um, uh, no rims on my bearings. And of course, Basically, even if you reach the displacement capacity, you have a little bit longer before the bearings leave complete stability and you have failure without increasing those imp or, um, story drifts. Uh, for brace frames, the system, the results were a little bit different. Making it stronger didn't help as much, um, but the having larger displacements um, helped quite a bit. Uh, and also having no rims had that similar effect. Very, very low drifts until um, failure of the system. Um, so what causes failure? So if you have rims, it's this mix of both bearing uplift and excessive superstructure yielding, um, except if you, and that's true for moment resisting frames, for concentrically brace, uh, brace frames, all instances were from excessive superstructure drifts, um, unless you have no rims on the bearings and then everything comes from bearing failure. So we also looked at probabilities of failure now using this IDA method. Um, and we found that for some systems, we were like right at this ASCE 7 target of 10% probability of collapse. For some, we were a little bit above. We weren't really happy with this because these are isolated structures and we are expecting better performance out of these isolated structures, but really we're achieving just what we get for typical buildings. And is that really right? Um, we also compared the probability of um, collapse for rigid versus flat rims. We found that flat rims gave you a little bit of a reduced probability of collapse here. Um, and this is really because it's much bigger for concentrically braced frames because it was so dominated by excessive superstructure drift. Um, that could be mitigated by using BRBs, which are commonly used in isolated buildings in Japan. Um, but the flat rim bearings are mostly giving you that increase because it had a little bit of increase in displacement capacity by allowing the puck to travel over the rim. Really, the key here is increased displacement capacity. That's what's driving the collapse probability. Um, so from that small study, we found that CBFs perform better in smaller earthquakes, but have larger collapse probabilities, and that um, Collapse for MRFs benefit from strengthening while CVFs do not for rigid rim. Um, and that when you had a flat rim, it really helps um, concentrically brace frames. Um, but the improvement was smaller for a moment. But really the overall finding, the key thing here is the most important design variable if you're really trying to maintain continual occupancy in isolation is to have bigger bearings. That's where your money should be going if you're going to try to um, improve the performance in these isolation systems. So that led us to this question, you know, 
the ASCE 7 in the US has, this is not for isolation, this is for all buildings, these category or risk categories. So if you're in a hospital, you're a risk category four, and it has different probabilities of collapse that are targeted. So 10 would be for a typical office building, but most isolated buildings are being built as hospitals here, 2.5% target. Are we reaching that? Because we have no change, you know, so, Typically we design our buildings with an R or isolated buildings with an R of one. So no reduction in force, um, but otherwise there's no change to the design methodology. We don't make our rims or our displacement capacities of our isolators build bigger. So what really is the collapse probability that we're achieving for hospitals and emergency centers? I think this is probably something that is a very similar conversation in, in Europe. Um, so, I, this is really just a big point for me. You need to think about what collapse probability you actually want for your building. If you're going to do a real performance-based design, a real, really get your bang for the buck out of isolation. Um, we have two approaches that we're looking at this right now. This is ongoing research with my students. One is using a machine learning strategy where we're building these databases, um, using GP models to sort of understand what the probability of collapse would be um, and select from permissible design region um, to, to choose our building design. Um, so we generate databases of these buildings with these random uh, variables, including lots of different uh, design accelerations, periods, damping, um, and amplification for mocap. How much bigger should that mocap be? Also strength reduction factors. Um, so we randomly design these buildings, um, run them under these earthquakes and find if they collapse or not. And we use that binary collapse, no collapse da um, data to build uh, a database from which we can do an estimation where we look at the probabilities of collapse. So here I can see this is related to the strength. So this is actually, this two is a weaker structure, 0.5 is a stronger structure. This is a gap ratio. So this is just what would be required by code as one. This is three times what code would require. And you can see each of these contours is telling you the probability of collapse. So clearly if you're getting code, you're not even reaching 10% probability of collapse, you're much higher. Um, and from here, you can see that the gap ratio is the most important thing for decreasing collapse risk, followed by um, increasing the superstructure strength. It's a much smaller contribution, but it's still there. Um, the other thing that we're doing to try to look at uh, what would be the easiest way to design for these extreme events is do you really need a 3D model for extreme analysis? So this is sort of de rigueur in, in the US. Everybody assumes you need a full 3D model to capture all the effects really well, but this is not true all around the world. So in Japan where isolation is fully adopted and, and embraced, they use these stick models um, to analyze the buildings. Um, and so the stick models are based on 3D models where they take the 3D model, they do a pushover on it to find what the, would be the hysteretic behavior of each um, spring. And then they actually do the numerical or the time series analysis for the earthquake on the stick model rather than the full 3D model, which is a large reduction in numerical costs. Um, so we're trying to compare if we use this stick model versus the full model, you know, how close can we get in terms of our probability of collapse? So these are ongoing work that we are trying to make it more simple to understand what your, your collapse probability is because it's an important part of your design. Um, with that, I think I'm done. Um, I wanna thank all of my students that have contributed to this presentation who are listed here and um, the supporters for this particular work. And you can always email me to ask for the papers that um, uh, are included in this talk. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tracy. That was a very nice uh, presentation. Um, I would like to uh, start uh, by offering the floor to my co-moderator, actually, for a question. So, Joan, uh, would you like to start? 
Yeah, Eleni, uh, start the questions from the audience. But uh, yes, I have one here. Or you can start with your own as you Okay. I thought if maybe allow, do, yeah, well, <laughs> we can be selfish and start with our yeah. own questions first. So in this way, I will I will start with my questions so uh, people, the audience will have more time to put more questions on the board. Uh, Tracy, as you know, I'm from a country that uh, uh, earthquake is not very important. We have very uh, small regions with uh, seismicity in Spain, so I don't have very big questions for you, but they are more uh, some kind of curiosities. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you have shown that these uh, friction uh, bearings, in some mm -hmm. cases, they have very big impacts no? with the rims. And so I'm wondering uh, which, which type of material should be used, because I assume that these, uh, there are high pressure contacts in these uh, surfaces. So which material is used for this? You mean for the, the liners? Yes. So it's a, usually a, a it's PTFE, polyvinyl Teflon, but it's all proprietary. So every manufacturer will have their own. Yeah, but then also with the rims, the, the material of the oh. rim. Oh, the material of the rims yeah. is usually the same steel that uh, it's usually the same stainless steel that is um, uh, the same as the sliding surface. So it's all integrated. And, and made out of the same component. So it's regular, um, regular steel, no, not- Regular steel. Not, okay. Uh, another, another curiosity is about, uh, about the resilience of the system. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, normally you will have failures because of the building, not because of the uplift of the movement and so on. So my question is, uh, how is this to uh, try to repair one of these buildings after failure? So typically these bearings would be replaced if there was a major flaw in the bearing. So what I think was interesting was even if there's like this damage that I can visually see, the performance of these bearings is actually really, really robust. So you can see this, um, the, the black here is actually after we've had this major impact and damage to the bearing. Now, if you had an earthquake and your column was damaged, right, and you saw us falling and everything, I don't think you would expect such robust behavior. So this is really special to isolator systems that you are, I mean, you're changing your, your stiffness by, or your strength by, by 10%. It, it's it's really great, um, but if you had major major damage to the bearing, you would take the bearing out and you would replace it, um, which is actually uh, generally you have a crawl space underneath your building and you can jack it up and and pull it in and out and you do it one by one. But anyway, you have to replace the bearing. No no way to make some kind of uh, repair or you have to replace the bearing. It would depend completely. on what kind of damage it is. So for example, if I was looking at um, these flat sliding surface bearings, I would just replace this inner puck. I don't think that the top and bottom surfaces would need to be replaced at all. Um, this bottom right hand might need to not need to have any damage. But for these bolted rims where I have damage to the sliding surface as well, you would need to replace the whole bearing. I would say that you know a practicing engineer would most likely err on the side of replacing the full bearing. Okay, so let's go now to one question from the audience. This is uh, Erwin. Say a moment, moment frame system buildings is located in seismic design category D. Then according to AEC 7, the design should, shall use a special detailing, SMRF. My question is, can I use an OMRF plus isolator and ensure the performance level is met? Or am I required to use SMRF plus isolator where the detailing works as a second defense mechanism? Is there any specific clause in uh, AEC 7 related to this issue? Yes, chapter 17 is very, very strong. A chapter 17 of ASC 7 has very small, you know, all the small print on the, the requirements of the code. Um, I don't want to say something wrong here uh, for the record. So um, I would say I think that you are allowed to use an ordinary moment resisting frame, but I am not the engineer of record on your project. So I don't want to. Uh, to put my foot in my mouth, um, but typically you can use not, um, uh, you don't need to use special moment resisting frames. You can back off a little bit on that. 
um, if you're using isolators. Now, the, it's not the same for concentrically braced frames. You have a penalty if you're not using um, uh, uh, the special designs for concentrically braced frames. Maybe I can extend another question from the audience. And this comes from Vikram Pakrasha. He's uh, actually the chair of the Eurostrat Association and is congratulating you on the talk. Uh, uh, his question would be the following. How reasonable is it to use vari vari variations of this design to adapt for variability of environmental effects? So, for example, temperature cycles, exposure with water, uh, possibly not a neutral pH and uh, aging. And can we look into degradation as well? So I guess this comes from the point of view of not only seismic, but also other effects. That could yeah. Maybe and this is very true, especially for bridges, right, where you have so much exposure. Um, in bearing or in uh, buildings, typically your isolators are shielded from the elements to some extent, um, but in bridges, your bearings are fully open to all the elements. Um, and so we've done a, a little bit of work looking at um, what happens when you have, uh, you know, traffic cycles, um, on bridges as well as uh, temperature expansion, contraction on bridges. So you have significantly more um, cycles. So we've looked at what the lifetime um, demands are, but we, we still have fallen short. We, we need a lot more um, uh, research on really how we can use that to understand maybe, um, you know, telling a bridge operator when they can replace their bearing. We need to do more experimental work on that. Um, as far as uh, friction pendulum bearings for corrosion, et cetera, uh, it hasn't been an issue as of such. Um, there has been written research, not by my group, um, but by uh, uh, um, Carrie Ryan at Nevada, looking at what happens when you have flooding and um, you might get water within these bearings or even if you get ice within these bearings. Um, and I think that she found that generally they still perform okay, generally because the forces are so large that um, any obstructions are not really an issue. Uh, but she, her research would be more of the place to look for that. That was an excellent question. May, may I add a, a comment on that? Because mm -hmm. I think that the, the materials used are more or less the same materials used for uh, a normal pot beating. I mean, uh, steel and Teflon, no? So probably- Yeah, this is all stainless steel. Even the stainless yeah. steel. So it's, the material is even more resistant to the, mm -hmm. to the weather than a normal uh, pot beating. So probably yeah. they, they, they should work off okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty resilient things. Maybe an additional question. Um, this comes from Sikandar Ali Kohar. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And it's more from the feasibility or more from the practical design, I guess, point of view. The question is, what is the cost comparison of this isolated system, I guess, to conventional mm -hmm. or other systems? And at what cost, as compared to these other systems, can this improved performance be achieved? So isolated build, I think this depends where you are in the world. So I don't have numbers for say Southeast Asia or Europe. Um, in the US, I usually look at a five to 10% premium of the total um, construction cost. And um, a lot of this is from the, de the extra engineering, the detailing, and you get these premiums on construction just because it's an atypical system. Um, I don't think that they have those same barriers in Japan because they just, they're more used to it. So I think with increased usage, we can decrease that. Um, but when you look at the lifetime performance of these systems, and you look at the lifetime maintenance costs from seismic events, then you're outperforming typical systems because you have much, much lower um, non-structural damage under those service level events, which are so frequent and typically drive your lifetime costs. Um, so, and then if we can really sort of fix and focus on the collapse probability, I think we'll have a full system that really you know, if you're looking at lifetime costs, it's it's a big benefit. 
Uh, Tracy, I see that in, from my side, there are no questions, uh, more questions from the audience. So uh, I would like to have more, not questions, but some curiosities about, because it's very interesting uh, subject. It's, uh, you talk about friction bearings, but mm -hmm. uh, as far as I see, the, the surface are not very, very rough. No, they are quite smooth. So, yeah. so, so why, the, why, why the name of friction? Because I, I, I suppose that the, the way of these buildings are working is because you have, in one side, you have an increase of the damping, and the other case, you have a change on the fundamental frequency. But the damping should, be, should come more from the friction, and I don't see too much friction between these surfaces, no? Yeah, so the friction is pretty well controlled by this PTFE liner. So okay. that's where all of the friction is coming from. Um, the friction is low. We want it to be quite low because um, you really are designing for the forces that come out of it. So if you have a 10% friction, then you need to design for 10% base shear. Um, so typical friction ranges from 2 to 15%. Uh, I'm trying to find really quickly. Like, so you are not looking uh, so much in an increase of the damping because of the friction, but more on the change of the natural frequency. This is the yeah, way. Yeah, so we're really trying to bring it. So extending the, the frequency to reduce. And then you do get some damping, um, but that's not the, the main. Yeah. I mean, you get quite high percent damping. So these friction pendulum bearings can get out to 20, 25 well, percent quite, damping. Quite much, a lot, much yeah. larger, even though you're only getting friction coefficients of 10 percent. Okay. Um, the rubber bearings are typically smaller, so you'll be with a natural rubber bearing five percent, you know, lead rubber bearing fifteen percent damping on average. Okay, and uh, another another uh, another comment. As I mentioned to you, I mean, uh, in my country, uh, seismicity is not important, but anyway, most of the uh, most of the small and medium uh, span bridges they are supported on rubber bearings. Right. So that means that even that uh, is not the case, they are more or less isolated. I mean, uh, they are designed on elastomeric and rubber buildings because of other things, no? because of the uh, uh, movements, because of the temperature, the shrink rate, and so on. But uh, I mean, uh, indirectly, they are also in some way quite of isolated structures, no? Yeah, so there's been research done here at Berkeley, also Illinois, that have actually looked at what the displacement capacity of these typical bridge bearings are, even if they're not designed to be isolated, and they have quite good performance yeah. um, under under small, medium earthquakes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe a question from me. Um, also, surprisingly, I'm working in a country where seismicity is not so much of a problem, but I come from Greece, where of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also curious. I think a big element here is testing for performance. And so experimentation plays a big role. And I was wondering, given that displacement, uh, of course, uh, is an important element of the performance, does this, is this uh, somehow critical for tests where one has to scale down? And does this scaling pose a bottleneck in some way uh, for you know, assessing also performance at full scale? Or is this not really an issue? Oh, this is a huge issue and we're always trying to lobby for it's not a big it doesn't seem to be a big priority here for you know uh engineers to fully understand and it's so expensive to do a full-scale test on these systems um and then furthermore you can do a full-scale test on one bearing but we've shown here that it's really these systems of bearings that control the failure of the system so to do a full-scale test of a full isolated building and actually take it to failure has never been done. And it's, you know, we're talking in the, you know, half million to millions of dollars of testing. So it's been a, it's been a huge challenge. One that I continue to lobby for, because I really think we need that full scale mm. test to truly understand the behavior. Hey, so you, no, go ahead, maybe, Eleni, go ahead. Maybe, maybe just to, um, as I'm wondering on the same topic, since you mentioned hybrid testing, can it create new potential for these kinds of uh, effects? Uh, I'm really hoping so. Um, the problem is, you know, without the model updating, I don't think we can because, you know, you're testing out to an unknown behavior. And if you're just simulating all the other bearings, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, if we can really get the model updating advanced enough 
so that we're continuously learning, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Eleni, I have a question, another question from the audience. This one is from Jean-Pierre Nicolas Chavez Aguirre. And the question is, uh, which is the best value for the damping coefficient for the first mode in seismic isolated structures and why? There's not a best value. Um, some researchers will tell you that they prefer to have a low damping value. If your damping gets too, too high, you can kick up higher modes and then you get unintended consequences. So, you know, keeping it below 20% would be a good thing to do, maybe 10 to 15%. Um, but this is just a rough estimate. You know, you need to look at what actually displacement capacity you physically have and then what are your demands and sort of do a trade-off there. Okay, also, okay. Oh. go ahead. No, no, no. no, it's another question from the audience. Mm -hmm. It's from, this time is from Andrea Dutu. And the question is, how many applications are there in the USA? Ah, in the USA, it numbers in the hundreds, I believe. You know, there's at least two, 300, 400 isolated buildings. Um, it, it's not, nearly in the order of, you know, Japan. But it, it's becoming more and more common, especially for hospitals um, and emergency centers. A lot of um, cities are realizing that, you know, when they rebuild or, or they're building new, um, so for example, uh, you know, Anytime they're, they're rebuilding these new critical systems, they're thinking more about what is their downtime after an earthquake. And so isolation is becoming more of a player there. It's what about bridges, isolated. Tracy? What about bridges? There are so oh, there's a lot of isolated bridges, in, especially in California. Uh, with this system, with these uh, friction, friction? Oh, yeah, with both rubber and friction pendulums. I would say it's almost equal. I also have a question from the audience, and this one comes from Huang Bin Lian. Uh, I think it was uh, maybe addressed, but, but let me transfer it again here. The question is, will there be a residual displacement of the bearing after an earthquake? And I think the experiment sort of showed that can't be the case. But the question then is, if so, how to deal with such issues to achieve self-centering? Yeah. Um, so I like to joke, joke that the aftershocks take care of it. So in my first set of experiments ever, we would run an earthquake and we'd have a residual displacement. It, it, it's typically small. We're talking on the order of like a centimeter here. Um, and then to, to recenter the bearing, all we did is put a jolt through the table and it would just recenter. It wants to be at the bottom, so there's no potential energy. Uh, but yes, there is some residual displacement. In, and I think that for a typical building, it wouldn't be a concern. Maybe your door would be, you know, a centimeter off from where it was before, but all of your um, detailing, architectural and mechanical detailing should be such that it accommodates that already. So I don't think it's a huge concern. I uh, have another question. Uh, this time is from Diego Pizarro Paul. It says, thank you for the presentation, Professor Becker. You say that important to have a better isolation system. You need larger isolators. But in which terms is this? I guess there is a point in which if I continue to increase the isolator, the superstructure will control instead of the isolation system. Yes. You have to get pretty large to, for that to happen. Um, so I'm just thinking, so you have your earthquake, your extreme earthquake that you're designing for. And if you design your isolators exactly for the median of that earthquake, then you have to think about 50% of the time, it's gonna be a bigger demand. And are you okay with your bearings exceeding 50% given that earthquake level. Um, we found that if it's 50% given that earthquake level, then you're not gonna have a very good robust performance. So maybe you wanna be doing the 84 percentile, you know? Um, so I think exactly where that number is, is still an ongoing topic of research. Um, and there's another question from Aryan Sarlehi, uh, and this concerns whether there has been a quantification in your study on the energy absorption of the isolated structure, and if there has been a comparison against other options for damping systems. Yeah, we haven't focused on that as much. It's a big area, um, but typically we assume it's like 2% or uh, damping just because most of the motion is in the isolators, so it's very small in the superstructure. Um, I 
think maybe Carrie Ryan looked at that. She had uh, some nice full scale tests at e defense in Japan. Um, so I'd look at her work if you're really interested. Okay, more questions from the audience. Uh, this is uh, Saber Fossil. And the question is uh, for the hybrid testing that you are working on, how do you consider different relative stiffness of isolators and peers due to the different peer aches in the model of dating? So we're numerically modeling the peers. We're assuming that we understand the peer performance. Um, maybe that's incorrect, but you have to draw the line somewhere. Um, then we're updating only the isolation performance because we don't really have any good models that have a rotation, axial, and shear combination in them. I'm going to go for a last question from the audience on my side, at least as we are soon uh, coming to a close. And this one is from Borislav Bellet. Uh, the question is, would the vertical component of seismic action increase the collapse probability of the tested bearings? So it's more on the influence of it's this. Great question, and we don't really know yet. Um, <laughs> We did a little bit of study on this numerically. So we developed those very robust um, models of the bearings. Um, and we found that if we included the vertical component, we didn't significantly change the collapse probability. So I don't think so, but we have no experimental data on this. Uh, I don't not have more questions, Eleni, from my side. Well, I guess this is right on time, uh, as we're slightly exited uh, uh, five, but I, I want to thank Tracy for her patience and for answering all of the questions <laughs> that we had from the audience. Uh, and also for a very interesting, uh, very nice talk, which uh, you will find also later on posted for those who want to catch some of the details that were shown. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Tracy. And thank you to Joanne for co-moderating this session. This is the last uh, session for this uh, uh, a spring, let's say, uh, round of our live talks, and we will be back in the fall with a new series. Uh, just for closing, as always, I want to give the floor to Tracy and uh, ask her to let, give us, uh, let's say, some final message she would like to leave the audience with. Oh, well, it's been a pleasure. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I just, I want to recommend isolation. You, It takes, um, it's, it's simple, but it, it's nuanced. So, uh, you know, you can really do a lot of amazing things if you really think about how the design is conducted. Um, so, you know, please reach out to me if you have any questions. And there's so many experts, both in Europe and the US. And, and around the world on isolation. And it, it's a fantastic tool to achieve your goals. Thank you very much. You'll Thank find you, more info from Sergio. Thanks everyone and hope to see you soon. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.